Good evening, guys, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Koppis. Um, we're here to talk about uh, service troubleshooting and diagnostic of refrigerated uh, cases that are on racks. Um, it's Saturday night. Um, we just got, well, I, I just got back from Oklahoma. I was up uh, training this week. We looked at some transcritical this week. Uh, we were also just randomly looking at other other cases. We had an instance this week, one of the cases that we were talking about. The system was a hot gas defrost, and when it went into defrost, you actually had a differential of 110 pounds between the hot gas, uh, the hot gas supply, and the uh, header, uh, header pressure. What was happening was someone adjusted uh, the DDR uh, up to about 35 pounds, which was too high for the system, as well as adjusting the holdback valve up to 185 PSI. And because the condenser fan motors control the, uh, I'm sorry, the pressure transducer on the discharge side controlled the uh, condenser fan motors, what would happen was it would go into hot gas defrost, start kicking on a whole bunch of condenser fan motors, cause a hellacious differential between the discharge gas and the header pressure, which would restrict all the refrigerant from going out to the refrigerated cases and cause slow recovery in a whole bunch of cases, as well as causing uh, other cases on the system to go in high in town. What did you have the pleasure of working on this week, Kev? So I was actually uh, down by you this week, all week. So I was down in Dallas helping out the branch down there with some commissioning. Me and uh, one of my guys from Chicago flew down on Monday to basically recommission a uh, site. Can't go into super details about it because it's a test test facility. But, uh, yeah, we went there to, to commission a bunch of uh, digital compressors and tune a bunch of case controllers to get as much out of them as we could so we could see how far we could push this equipment. Uh, pretty good training training opportunity for me and the guy that were there. I mean, this is uh, something not too many people have tried to do, so we were able to uh, pull it off, and, you know, we had to stay an extra day. We had uh, some unforeseen things go there, go wrong there, a lot of, a lot of iced up coils that we had to deal with. Um, other than that, it was a – Pretty good time. Got to enjoy some good food down by you and you know, nice warm weather for once. And yeah, that was my day. I pretty much flew back on Thursday and uh, just uh, helped out with some commissioning on Friday. And I know you can't go into like super details, but you have to share what you found with the uh, the heat craft coils. So basically, we had some coils in this freezer that were uh, replaced. All of them were replaced. Uh, in the last month and a half and the entire front sides of the coils were solid blocks of ice along with the back sides partial top the top of the back sides were solid blocks of ice well we spent like 13 hours de-icing these coils um into the into the next day almost and once we got them all de-iced we were uh you know monitoring the system and just tr- checking defrost temps and I mean, I had these coils up to like an hour and a half defrost almost, and they weren't clearing the tops. So I, I figured we were missing a heater the way they were laid out, but the way that they were laid out, it went it, from the bottom of the coil, it went heater, 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 space, heater, heater, space, space, space. So there was a straight six inches from the top of the coil to the next heater. So what was happening is the top of the coil wouldn't get warm enough during a defrost period to melt all that frost off and it was causing uh, the tops of the coils to lose airflow and it was affecting the TDs on our coils. So this whole job was about getting the TDs out, the exact TDs out of these coils. So it was throwing off all of our calculations and everything else. So what actually had to happen is we figured we were missing a heater. So we reached out to Heatcraft finally. We got a hold of an engineer and it turns out when they do these, uh, when they build these, evaporators they build them upside down well their drawing is probably the worst drawing i've ever seen because if you look at the drawing it looks like it's it looks like it's correct 
if you, if you were looking at it, building it upside down. But <laughs> so they had to pull every single heater out of these things and rearrange them. And at that time, it was minus nine in the freezer. <laughs> So I'm glad I flew out as that was happening. So I didn't ha- I didn't get the uh, you know chance to sit in that freezer for a day and a half moving heaters around because uh, I don't envy those guys. That's going to be a bad one. Yeah, at least you <laughs> would have been better if you would have found it. I don't know when the box was maintaining temperature, but whatever. Yeah, when it was ten degrees, it'd have been a lot better to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, start to dive in on this one. We're going to go over. Uh, basically how me and Brett would start a service call at a store. So this is how we walk into just about every service call we do. So as we get there, you know, obviously check in with the manager, talk to them, see what's going on. I mean, they're the ones using the equipment every day. So they're the ones noticing little things. I mean, whether it's, you know, useful information or not, or they're just complaining to complain because you're there costing them money. But I mean, sometimes you may get some useful information out of them. But the way I start all these calls, I tend not to look at our, you know, our dispatching software to see who was there or what's been done before. I tend to not care about that. Like, I I think it's worse when guys look at that. You know, when they look, when they first get to a call, they start looking at the equipment history on their, on their dispatching software or whatnot. I mean, because then you're just going to be looking at what the next, the last guy did. And if it is a callback, you don't want to do what the last guy did because you want to go in there with an open mind. So you want to go in there with an open mind. So that way you could look at this from a, you know, a different perspective. Now nah, I don't want the last guy said, because I mean, the last guy, if you're there, the last guy was probably wrong. So I generally try to try to not look at that stuff or not look at log books until I'm like further into it. So that way I can look at this with an open set of eyes. So I'll go to the case first always or the walk-in coil or whatever, whatever's running warm. And I'll take a gander at it just, just to make sure that, you know, I have airflow. I'm not iced up. I'm not, um, I don't have product sticking out of the case. If it's a product running warm call, you know, I'll, I'll check over the case, make sure it's not iced, make sure I don't see any weird frost patterns on the coils, make sure all my fans are working or make sure it's not a, a thermometer issue, you know, check the case temperature real quick with my thermometer, you know, then after that, I tend to, you know, stop, you know, doing any of the case and I move on to the rack and go to the rack controller and make sure everything is functioning properly with the rack and everything is good up there before I go any farther to check superheats or pull strainers or do anything like that. You got anything to add to that, Brett? No, uh, besides, you know, not not believing anybody because that's burned me more than on one occasion. Um, at least three times I, I can think of where, you know, listening to a technician, even while they're on site, you know, going through and telling you, at, you know, after you ask a question, hey, did you check the, the temperature to make sure it's accurate? Oh, yeah, we checked it. We checked it. Uh, you know, and I started working on the case for about a good two, two and a half hours trying to figure out why this case won't pull down the temperature. Keep going back to the controller and seeing what the temperature was and, you know, come to find out that the, you know, temperature sensor was off by about eight degrees. So, you know, I that and, you know, you hit the nail on the head with not reading the service history. Too many times that leads you down the wrong, wrong rabbit hole. And, you know, you start looking at other stuff because you're reading the other, you know, the other service ticket. Um, fresh eyes is always the best, you know, imagine it's a brand new call, you know, that way you're not, you're not led astray by someone else's notes. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. I find, I find guys all too often getting hung up on that, like especially newer guys and, you know, greener apprentices, just looking at what the last guy did. And to be honest, I really don't care what the last guy did. So I, I think it's, you know, better to come in with a fresh set of eyes. So you, you want to move on to the rack part of it, Brett? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first off, you're going to check to make sure that the the system is actually calling. Uh, obviously, make sure that the if it has an electronic EPR, the electronic EPR is actually, if it's the case is warm at that point, it should be calling to be 100% open. Um, make sure all the, all the compressors are, are running and actually maintaining proper suction pressure. Uh, typically, your rack is running about two degrees lower than 
um, mm. what the what the what the lowest SSD is typically calling for. So if your lowest SSD which you're working on happens to be plus eighteen, you know typically your rack should be running at around uh, sixteen degrees, and they do that to accommodate for pressure drop in the pipe. You know, just because you're running, you know, 18 degrees saturated, at the I mean that you're going to be running uh, 18 degrees saturated uh, out of your case because of the, you know, the footage of pipe. You know, you might have a case that has 250, 300 foot worth of pipe. Making sure that your discharge pressure is, is accurate and right at set point. I usually tell this to make sure that the discharge pressure is running uh, either at uh, at the set point of the, that the controller is calling for. If it's calling for TD, make sure it's it's working properly because having a elevated discharge pressure will in fact cause your suction pressure to be elevated. Also making sure you have a proper uh, receiver level. Typically I like to see anywhere from 25, 30%. Making sure you do have a full column of liquid making sure, you know, checking the refrigeration schedule, seeing what temperature the liquid is supposed to be entering into the TXVs. You'll usually find this under the subcooler section of the refrigeration schedule. It'll tell you, you know, 75 degree entering a liquid at the TXVs, 50 degree liquid, and just make sure that that uh, liquid is at the proper temperature. If not, it's going to affect the sizing of the expansion valve and potentially cause that valve to be undersized and not work properly. Yeah, um, one thing I wanna to add to that, especially with the receiver level, uh, being up north, you may need a little bit more gas in there. So, I mean, typically I like to see like 30, 40%, you know, it's in full and maybe like 50 to 60 in split just to make sure we have enough gas for, you know, when that coil comes out. So one so, thing, you go ahead, Brett. Sorry, sorry. Uh, your customer spec. So, I mean, so the reason why I said that is because, you know, technically we usually always go by customer spec. Mm -hmm. So for a customer, you know, a customer down here, I'm, I'm wondering like for a target up North, uh, do they call for a receiver level as high as 60% up there? Um, they don't, but here's the problem. So I know it's like 40 or something. I, I haven't done service for target in a while. I, I tend to be, I'm tend, tend to be more on a construction side right now, but, um, here's the problem. So up here we're splitting it on splitting so much. I mean, you guys don't deal with that as much as we do. I mean, you get down there, you know, ambient's cold every once in a while, but up here, I mean, we got the we got the condensers just as big as you guys. I mean, everybody's been sizing everything for 110 up here for a while. I mean, you guys are obviously a little more than that, but so we get these big 10, 12 fan condensers, and I mean that thing may hold 300, 300, two, 300 pounds of gas when it on splits, and splits. So if you don't have, if you're running a 25 percent receiver level, and you go into you go into full condenser, that's going to take like at least maybe maybe 100 pounds of gas out of that receiver. I mean, that, that's a lot of gas to take out of that thing. So, I mean, you just got to be mindful with that. I mean, I, I, tend, typically, I typically tend to graph it, and if I see it jumping, then, yeah, then there's probably an issue. And I need to, you know, maybe look into it, maybe add a little gas if it's bouncing like that. You know, but again, like you said, it all depends on customer spec. So you want to take it from there, uh, check. Yeah. Go ahead. So the, the other thing I want to, you know, say is I find this all too often is, uh, guys will look at a rack controller and say, okay, the suction pressure is, you know, set points, 42 pounds, it's running 42 pounds, but they'll, they won't throw a, you know, gauge or a transistor on there to check and see if it actually is. I mean, all too often, I mean, that's a simple thing, simple thing to overlook is, uh, you know, is, is the computer actually displaying the proper information? You know, I, I'll throw that on there. And then as I'm going through there, if I make sure my liquid levels look good, I'll graph them out if I can. And if I'm, my liquid levels are good, make sure my sight glass is clear at, at the, uh, 
the liquid shell dryers. Make sure I got a good clear sight glass. If I got bubble in the sight glass, even though it's one case, I mean, if you have a pressure drop on there and you're not getting a full combo liquid out to the out to the uh, to the case, I mean, that could greatly affect your case your case uh, performance. So, I mean, I find all too often guys guys miss that. They'll you know start writing up dryers at the case or TXVs or something else when uh, you you got plug dryers at the rack. So that's one thing to be mindful of. And I try to check that every time I'm in there, you know, check, just do a visual over the side glass, make sure the side glass isn't flashing, make sure it's clear. Um, and then just, I move on from there and I'll go to the, whatever, whatever's controlling the actual temperature of the case, whether it be a liquid line solenoid, a suction stop, a EPR, a CDS valve, electronic EPR type type of valve and I'll make sure that is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing making sure that like the EPR didn't lose its position maybe the seats reset a little bit you know make sure it's running the proper SST you know what's on what's on the refrigeration schedule or the manufacturer spec so make sure that's good and then I'll check the EPR make sure that didn't lose its place you know make sure that it's actually if it says it's 100% open make sure it's actually 100% open make sure it's at you know at suction pressure and then from there, or if I have a liquid line solenoid, you know, I'm checking to make sure I'm actually getting my full liquid pressure on the other side of it, because you could have a liquid line solenoid that's, you know, got a 30, 40 pound drop on it affecting that case. So I like to see everything at the rack running properly. Head pressure is at, you know, what the rack controller says it's supposed to be, or, if you don't have a rack controller, it's at TD, you know, over the ambient. Make sure that your uh, drop leg pressure is not dropping too low. You know, make sure that that's staying at what it's supposed to be. Make sure everything at the rack is running properly and good before I move on back down to the case to start checking th uh, further into the case, superheats and stuff. Because, I mean, all too often, even if it's one case, I've seen so many times guys overlook things at the rack when there's issues at the rack and uh, they're, they're missing the big picture. So that's why I like to start at the case, you know, check over a few things and then move on to the rack and make sure I'm good at the rack before I, I start looking at this case. And then if you have, if you have the computer and you actually have temp sensors in the case, which I mean, all stores should now, but there's so, so many still that don't, you know, graph out your case and, See, see what the graphs have been doing the last couple of days. You know, look at the trends and make see if it's actually defrosting or if it's, you know, struggling to pull down after defrost or if it's been slowly trending up or, you know, just go from there and to see see how, how everything else looks on that. You want to take the next part of it, Brett? Yeah, since you're already up with the controller anyway, check the defrost schedule. Um, you can compare this to the refrigeration schedule. Uh, Preferably check the check the uh, IOM from uh, from the internet. Uh, I've found in the past you can have some discrepancies with as far as the defrost schedule and the proper SST um, per the refrigeration schedule per the per the actual manufacturer. So preferably just double check to make sure you know all the specs that are actually on the refrigeration schedule. Are in fact right. Um, make sure uh, your case temperatures are accurate. Sometimes you might have to have someone with you to do that because by the time you know you walk downstairs <clears throat> by two or three degrees. So that's another thing you should be checking once you verified everything. Back to checking the the ref uh, I'm sorry. Back to checking the defrost schedule. Uh, if you are looking it up in the internet, sometimes less information is more. Example, if you have a Hill Phoenix case and the case model number is an 05M-12-NRG, leave the 12 out, leave the N and just look at 5DM. Uh, that goes with Hussman cases, that goes with the Kaiser Warren cases, you know, always footage of the case out because that's not the true blue model number. That's basically just you know, the footage of the case, which will throw one. And once you verified your temperature sensors, um, you know, you're going to check to see how the cross pattern is on the case. 
uh, see or see if it's actually iced. If uh, it's just iced, I'm sorry, if it's frozen, um, that might be an indication of, you know, possibly a defragile issue. Um, if the case is only maybe halfway frosted up, uh, that might be an indication that you have an issue with your the typical medium temp cases are supposed to have six to eight degrees of superheat, uh, three to five degrees for low temp. If your superheat is off, you know, think about it. You're not basically feeding enough. You might only be utilizing a quarter of the coil, a half of the coil. And so now you're relying on that whole case to basically, you know, refrigerate that whole space. Checking your uh, filter drive. I'm a big proponent. I don't like, you know, some people say, you know, oh, two to three degrees drop across filter dryers. If you really have like any more than a degree across that dryer, cut it out. Um, checking your screens. A lot of times you'll, uh, with doing the visual inspection, you can kind of see what is really going on, you know, with the feeding of the, of the expansion valve. Typically, if you have a distributor in the system, you'll see, if you have, I'm sorry, if you have a restriction in the system, you'll start from the expansion valve or before before the distributor. Normal, under normal operations, if there is a nozzle in that distributor, you should be having frost at that nozzle. You shouldn't have it before. Um, right after the expansion valve, you have a perfect harmonious mixture of liquid, and, and that's why it's not frosting up the nozzle. Right at the nozzle is where it actually starts boiling off there. So just that that's a hint to, you know, what to look for. Visual inspection, also making sure that you're in the right location, making sure that your power head is, is correct. You know, you might have a low, someone might have put a low temp power head on a medium. Uh, the notations for spore lens uh, power heads, C is for commercial charge, which I believe is for 50 degrees to negative 10 degrees and i think low temp is from zero to negative four so make sure right power head in for the proper application that you're utilizing um, make sure that your proper airflow making sure the by looking at the iom manual they will tell you exactly how many feet per minute you're supposed to have they make a they used to make a tool tool called an Alnor Junior that checked your airflow for the feet per minute. They no longer make that tool. The only thing that I found that's comparable to that is the Testo 410i. Uh, that will actually measure the feet per minute coming out of the case. In the IOM manual, it'll actually tell you uh, that you have to check it directly after defrost, after the uh, coils are clear, though. You can't check it midway through operations so of the, the defrost is six times a day. Um, you can't check it, you know, toward, towards the second or third hour because otherwise that frost is going to restrict, it's going to throw your airflow off. Make sure that you are checking it directly after a defrost. Uh, making sure down in case that you do have the proper suction pressure. Uh, this is going to also going to be checked while you're, while you're doing your superheat. Making sure that, like I said, it's uh, the suction pressure should be within two pounds of what the rack is running when your EPR is at 100. I'm sorry, when your electronic EPR is at 100. percent If you have a mechanical EPR, then obviously that's going to be set up at the rack, so you should have the correct S time. If you don't, you're going to have to go back up, back up to the rack, and set that accordingly. Kevin, you want to add? Yeah couple things I want to I want to add to that uh, like you went over at the beginning about the uh, looking at the case specs so that should be every time you're working on a case you need to be looking at those case specs because if you don't know what that case is supposed to be doing you're not going to be able to properly fix it so you want to look at those case specs every time like I save everything in my Dropbox so I, I have uh, everything every time I work on some new piece of equipment I download the manual I save it in my Dropbox. So that way it's on my phone. All I got to do is pull up my Dropbox, type in, you know, the first couple letters and it pulls it right up on my uh, Dropbox. I can look at everything. I know the case specs, defrost, uh, airflow, if it has it, Husband, you have to actually call them for airflow numbers. 
So they don't put it on their uh, IOMs like Hill Phoenix does. So that's one thing to be mindful about. So if you need to get airflow specs from Husband, you need to actually call them. And just like Brett said, leaving off the NRG stuff, same thing with Husman with like some of the high the U's and stuff. You got to look up different. It, there may be a D5 case and there may be a D5 XL case or uh, XLG case. So you need to make sure you grab the right manual for that because it actually does change the specs slightly on those. So just just pay attention when you're doing those last couple letters of the Husman um, model number, where it's, if it's a U or something, it, that designates a different kind of case. Um, so once you, once you get that, you, you know what you're supposed to be working on then. Yeah. Like Brett said, and I'm the same way. Like, I don't want to see any temp drop across the dryer. I've also seen dryers with zero temp drop and a pressure, you know, a 10, 20 pound pressure drop across them. It just depends on, you know, the ambient and area that it's in. So, and how much that valve feeding, I, I've seen dryers that are plugged and I've seen the strainers be plugged also. And then there's not very much temp drop at all. So it all depends on how much the load is on the valve and how much it's feeding. I am a big proponent of not having dryers in cases. And as long as it's not customer spec to have it in there, I'm cutting that thing out and putting a piece of hard copper there. As long as my TXV, TXVs have removable strainers. I'm a big fan of just having removable strainers because at 2 o'clock in the morning, just like everybody else, I'm not wanting to pump down a case and start cutting out dryers. So I always try to, if, if there's just strainers in there, I'll just cut out the dryers and then just clean the removable strainers. And one thing I'll just tell you guys this, do, do not pump down a lineup and cut one dryer out. If there's four cases, do the dryers on all the cases, because what's going to happen is you're going to fix that case. And then the case next to it is going to have a slightly plugged dryer. You already pumped it down. You already had it down. You might as well change them all because if that one next to it has a slightly plugged dryer and you go through and you get the superheat right on the, on the case you just fixed, now that case is going to be out of balance with the other case. It's going to be running colder. And if it's on an EEPR, electronic EPR, you're going to end up having one case that's, you know, if it's medium temp, popping the, the low, low temperature alarm while the other ones are running high. So if you've got it down, just do the dryers on all of them or cut them out and hard pipe them. So it all depends on what your customer spec is. Me personally, I'd rather not have dryers in cases. I think they cause more problem, problems than they're worth. I think the dryers at the rack are a little bit easier to control. And, I mean, guys, it doesn't mess up new guys as much having the dryers in the cases. I mean, I'd rather just, I'd rather just clean the TXB strainer. So... What what's your thoughts on that, Brett? As far as cutting out the dryers, yeah, yeah, just do it. <laughs> I do it like you said too many times. Where you know you'll have one one dryer that's partially blocked up, and you'll you know a week later you'll have the next one blocked up. Just cut them all the way out. Um, like you said, as long as there is a removable strainer, not see. Yeah, that's one thing. So that like some there's some electronic expansion valves that that don't well okay most electronic valves do not have a removable is there a serviceable strainer that works well that's that's three eighths that that's that you can install in case you know you don't have one that's serviceable so you can just cut it out i have not seen one but like the last five co2 startups i've done have had uh all sporlin valves with removable strainers on them so they actually they actually took the sbqe like you know, like style strainer with the right angle. And they put that in the SER or SER, yeah, SER valves now. So you could order an SERC or SER AA. You could order that with a, uh, with a removable strainer, like, like an, uh, like a standard uh, balance port valve would. Yeah. They just take so, longer. <laughs> yeah. They just take longer to get, I mean, actually like this supply house up by us is like starting to stock them. So they, they, they've actually started to stock them. So they're, they're taking less and less time to get, but I mean, there's just a huge demand for them right now. So I, I would rather have the, th the removable strainer the, and then same thing, like Brett said, like the airflow stuff, you just want to uh, be real specific with that. I know like when you start talking to like manufacturers, they want to see like a, a cup 
a cup basically on that on that meter because they say on theirs on theirs they're using a air full flow funnel basically to get more of an accurate reading. To be honest, I've made one of these out of a Dixie cup before. Just cut a, the back of the Dixie cup out and then shoved the Testo air meter in there. That's the the same. Brett has the uh, the the Bluetooth one. I have like the one where it just reads on the screen. And so I mean, I basically it's the same same exact sensor. Like Testo makes a great airflow meter. I have the Alnor Junior. It's it's almost dead nuts on with the Alnor Junior. So I mean, you just can't find them anymore. But I make that airflow cup, and then I'll stick it up in the honeycombs post defrost, and then I'll check the cases to make sure that I actually have good, uh, you know, good airflow. And I want it to be almost, you know, spot on. If it's not, I mean, there's a lot of these cases out here, and especially doing startup, uh, there's more times than not, like the cases come out with the wrong fan speed programmed in, and these, uh, these uh, programmable motors. And I mean, the last startup, I had to do 10 cases. I had to, I had random cases that were running slower than others. So I wasn't getting my TDs off those cases. Even with good superheats, I couldn't get my TDs. So that's one thing to, you know, keep in mind. And when you're, when you're, this is the other thing, when you're changing fan motors, please pay attention to the fan motor you're putting in there. Make sure it's the same or, um, better specs and make sure that it's not sticking higher or lower in the fan plenum in the actual like cup of the fan plenum, because that's going to extremely throw off your airflow. I'm a big fan of the rescue motors. The, I think they're the EC 5411 Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's been a while since I looked at one. Those motors pretty much can basically take care of just about every case motor we use. I mean, I, I, I have a couple watt motors in my truck, but just I probably have seven of those motors. So one thing about those rescue motors, there is um, they so the GE rectangle motors, those aren't the actual right height for the rescue motor. So they actually sell a plate that actually goes on the back. It shows you actually on the box. It's a round, a round plate that goes the whole uh the whole diameter of the of the motor and probably makes it stick up probably about three eighths of an inch. If you don't have that plate or you don't stock that plate on your truck, you can use washers to raise it up to make sure that it actually is sitting correctly. And that goes the same with using um, a four watt motor versus a nine watt motor. The difference besides obviously the wattage, same RPM, same voltage, but the the height of the motor. A four watt motor is going to be shorter than a nine watt. So make not that you have, if you, if there's a four watt motor in there, don't just throw a nine watt in there because like, like Kevin said, it's going to end up throwing off your airflow and causing uh, that case potentially to ice up because the, it's not going to be able to push that airflow all the way around. It's basically going to short cycle that air around and lessen the amount of air going out towards the honeycombs, which is going to lessen the amount of air curtain, which is going to allow for more infiltration. Remember, most of these cases are what they refer to as type one cases. Uh, 70, they're only made for 75 degree ambient and 55% relative humidity. If any one of those specs is above, if you have a higher humidity or a higher temperature, you are way more susceptible to ice up. Years ago, when the cases had less fins in the coils it was it wasn't that severe you could be a little bit higher in humidity it really wouldn't affect you all that much but as we got more efficient we had more fins per inch to make these coils more efficient they're extremely susceptible to higher humidity and higher temperatures so if you have multiple cases that are icing up at a store you know you got one set icing up one day one set icing up another Make sure you're checking your humidity and your temperature, making sure, you know, if you do have excessive frost, usually what will happen is the graph will, you know, be straight across, you know, holding temp. And then all of a sudden, probably about an hour, maybe half an hour before the defrost, it'll start spiking up. And then you'll see once it does go into a defrost, where normally it would start going up in temp, 
it will start going up in temp for a little bit and then it'll go back down and then back up. And that's typically because the frost, you know, the airflow at that point has punched a hole through the defrost or through, I'm sorry, through the frosted coil and then start using that frost to re-refrigerate the coil. So if you see, you know, jumping around uh, air temperature sensors, you know, before and after defrost, that's typically um, showing you that you have your frosting on your coils. Yeah, that's a that's another good point to bring up, right? Is the uh, humidity, especially with uh, newer stuff. Like I've seen guys where it's super humid in the store, and they're trying to set superheats on medium temp cases. And I mean, guys don't really realize how much of that coil gets, how much the load increases on that coil, especially like high efficiency coils when the humidity's in dew points higher. More of that coils being used for you know, latent heat removal, you know, transferring that, that humid, humid air into, into, you know, water vapor condensate and then rolling off the coil. I mean, that, that takes up a large portion of that coil and then it eats up our sensible heat that we're getting. So I've seen more times than not guys working on, you know, can't get knee cases down the tent or whatnot. And then you look over and I mean, the store humidity is like 65, 70%. I mean, that, that right there is just increasing the load on the cases tremendously, not to mention it's going to be causing ice ups and frost overs and everything else. But I mean, I'm a big proponent, like sometimes, I mean, not every time, but if they have time, I want guys to get up on the roof and check the dehumidification units. I mean, especially if it's a Munners, I mean, when those things work, they work good, but they usually only work for like a month and then they're, they're usually broke again. I mean, those things are down all the time. No matter what you do to them, they just, they're just very problematic units. So I, I, like, I want guys to get up there and check because I, I would rather, you know, guys catch a dehumid unit acting up, you know, during the week than somebody be there at 2 o'clock in the morning with 32 feet of meat cases iced over. And uh, one other thing I want to bring up with that is if you're using electronic EPR, especially these new cases, you're going to be wanting to use pull-down percent. The, uh, inside the controller, there's a... Uh, after defrost pull down uh, percentages where you could lock that valve say at like 20 to 30 percent now i tend to try to use pull downs and just about everything if i can as long as it's not the customer spec not to use them because two things with this i mean it'll it'll solve uh overshooting issues like if you have like cases overshooting after defrost you know, they get, they're real warm. That valve opens hundred percent. That case gets cold real quick and it, it, it overshoots and you got one case running slightly warm, one case hitting the low alarm. So, I mean, it, it'll solve that issue. And then it'll also solve issues with, you know, you opening up hundred percent right after defrost, that coil still got a little bit of moisture on it. And now you're hitting rack suction pressure. And if the rack suction saturation temp is pretty low, I mean, you may, you may start to freeze all that moisture on that coil and, and start to frost over the coil. So I tend to like to put like 20 to 30% pull downs for like maybe like a 20 minute, 30 minute, half hour, depending on what it is. So that way it uh, doesn't frost over the coil. The other thing it does is it, it kind of lessens the load on the rack because post defrost, you know, now you've got that, you got this high pressure suction gas that's trapped in this coil that's been defrosting you know you may have 100 150 pounds of pressure in that line if you slam that you know valve open to 100 percent, it's going to you know end up forcing a compressor or two on it's going to increase your suction pressure so instead of you know putting all that load in the rack if we open that valve say 20 30 percent open it slowly then you know we may be able to pull down with what we have maybe maybe stage one compressor on or an unloader on. So that way we're not, you know, just slamming the rack on and off after every defrost. I mean, the, the, the more consistent you keep the rack, the better. So, I mean, it helps save energy and then it helps save wear and tear on the rack at the same time. What's your thoughts on that, Brett? No, I totally agree with it. Um, preventing, preventing potential flood back, uh, preventing, you know, preventing over cycling on the compressors. Uh, you're only really supposed to have 10 cycles per hour on the compressors, uh, max about 240. Any more than that, you start wearing, uh, making, causing a whole bunch of wear and tear on everything. Uh, the starters, the compressors, 
you know, vibration, you're just, you're, you're causing more wear and tear than what it's worth. So the less amount of big impacts on the rack that you can cause, the better. One thing I forgot to bring up, uh, if you do have a lineup that is completely iced over, and or I'm sorry, frosted over, and you're trying to, uh, instead of having to get out the hose and de-ice 40 feet of medium temp lineup, if you close the suction line ball valve and let the liquid line feed, you know, you're essentially bringing more pressure into that, into that case. And, and obviously, the, you know, we all know PT charts, the higher the pressure, the higher the temperature. So if you continue to let that feed, you'll de-ice, you'll basically raise the pressure in the suction a lot faster. And then basically de-ice that, that coils or the coils a lot faster. Uh, just like Kevin said, though, when it comes time to open that thing up, just make sure you do it slowly. One, so you, you know you don't uh, overload the rack. Two, so you don't cause a whole bunch of short cycle on the compressors. And three, to make sure that you don't flood out your rack. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good point. And the, the other thing I would like to bring up is so like going to like product temp issues. So a lot of calls, you, you know, you may have good discharge air temp in a case. You could have perfect discharge air temp in a case, say it's 32 degrees and that's the spec. And you could still have 54 degree product. So uh, this, this messes up a lot of guys. And after you make sure that case is running, you know, properly, what you're going to want to do if you have product temp issues, just take a look at the ca- how the case is set up. Does the case have the proper shelf length in there? You can find that in the manual. I see all too often you get these reset teams come in there and they're just putting whatever shelves they find in the case or this shelf looks good and it may require 17 inch shelves in the case and you've got 20 inch shelves. Now that product's out of the, it's in the air band or it's out of the case, out of the air band or it's disrupting the air band, which is going to cause, you know, warm air from inside the store to come inside the, the case and it's going to cause the case to run you know it may cause the case to run warm or it's going to cause the product temp to be warm so that's one thing to be mindful for do you have the correct shelves and then everything new now seems to be these pushers and these uh pegboard shelves so uh everything with pegboard and pushers all these these aftermarket shelf uh setups you have to have a plexiglass fake shelf underneath each Neath of the pushers, even if the pushers are uh, solid bases and the pegboard, you have to have a plexiglass fake shelf that goes all the way to the back wall of the case. Now, this simulates uh, a proper shelf for proper airflow. If you do not have this, what ends up happening is the air flows down the back wall of the case or it starts spiraling inside the case and it ends up washing out the air curtain. Hill Phoenix has a really good, great example of this inside their case IOMs. I'm pretty sure it's just about every newer case IOM. There's like a page or two where it shows like the air swirling around inside the case. I mean, it's something I would take a look at. I mean, especially the greener guys, so they understand this. But you're going to want to make sure like you have a fake shelf on those. I, I've seen it all too often. You know, the front side of a pusher, you know, that will you know be running warm. And just because that case has been like that for eight years, doesn't mean that it's not been a problem the entire time or is a new problem now. So don't look at something just because it's been there for a long time or it's been this way for a long time that it's not a problem because it's probably a problem and nobody's ever caught it or done anything about it. So that's one thing to be mindful of. So make sure you have the proper shelves and the proper shelf setup. And same thing for angled shelves. A lot of uh, manufacturers, especially Hill Phoenix, on the meat cases, they have these clips are these like shelf extending brackets on the back of their shelves. And if they're on an angle, there's actually like a two and a half inch gap between the back of the shelf and the back of the case. And there's these spring loaded L brackets that you have to cut zip ties off of. And what ends up happening is a startup guy doesn't go around and cut all the zip ties or the uh, carpenters when they put the shelves in, then those shelves are going to have like a two inch gap. And that cold air ends up falling down the back wall and then goes down through the bottom of the case, and then you don't get that shelf temperature so that you need to get. So that's one thing to be mindful of when you're looking at stuff. Make sure your shelves are proper. Make sure your product's not sticking out of the case. Make sure your return air grates aren't blocked. 
Make sure your suppliers aren't blocked. Make sure that you have proper shelving. And then another thing that I see guys miss a lot, and I just found one on a store that's been open for 15 years, is, I mean, they, they finally got audited by the health department on this certain case, and the heat was running, and there was a vent blown in the case. So that's one thing to be mindful of. You hope it gets caught on startup. You know, make sure the HVAC vents aren't blowing into the case. I mean, I, I've seen vents be 40 feet away from a case, 40, 50 feet away, and uh, they're washing out a case. I mean, some could even be farther. I mean, it's just a little bit of air blowing that way is enough to interrupt that air curtain. So you want to be mindful of that. Make sure you're not uh, make sure you're not washing out the case. One easy way to test this is uh, old school ways with a smoke smoke pen. You know, you light it on fire and you could uh, smoke out the case and you could see if like the air is getting washed out, if it's not making it back to the return. So that's one way to check it. I just typically tend to use like toilet paper. If I think something's blowing in there, like see if it's, it'll move a toilet paper. If it, And then I'll just redirect the HVAC vents so they're not blowing in the case. So that's one thing to be mindful of, especially if it's like the first, first row of product that's uh, causing an issue. I have a thermal imager. They've come down a lot more. Like Flare makes a cheaper, way cheaper version of it. Like it's a, I think it's a TGI, like uh, ones. I think you have it right, Brett. Yeah, I think so. I think I don't remember the model number, but I mean, if, like I, I think about a year ago, I paid like three fifty four. Yeah, it's it's a hundred percent worth it. I mean, for for finding out issues like this, I mean, product temp issues, like it's, and you could show a customer right then and there, like, listen, this is a pusher issue. Like you could look, scan the case and that four foot section of pushers, maybe the only one it's warm. Well, that, that's the issue. So that's one thing you guys got to remember is uh, you could have perfect, perfect discharge air temp, but have 44 degree product temp. So that's one thing to be mindful of. You got to make sure that case is set up the way it's supposed to be. Because if you call that manufacturer for tech support and you tell them that it's got pushers, they're automatically going to blame the pushers because it's out of their design. So just just keep that in mind before you tell them that it has pushers that, you know, make sure you get all your specs and everything right and make sure your false shelves are there and make sure nothing's blown in there. And then make sure, like I've been seeing a lot of D-Strat fans, which are like fans up in the ceiling of the uh, – up high by the ceiling to to de-stratify the air basically to move around the air that's stagnant up at the top of the ceiling down the warm air blow it down to the sales floor so it also warms the sales floor up keeps the hvac zones more uh more comfortable and more even and then it it also uh helps save some energy keeps the hvac from cycling so much but they seem to put these right in front of every multi-deck case they could find and usually pointing right at it. So, like, I don't know how many D-Strat fans in the last two, two, two startups I did, I had to either move or get extra sport to move or just turn off because they're blowing into cases. I'm thoroughly convinced that the engineers, when they're making the plans for the supermarkets, they're like, where can we put the discharge air vents? Where can we put the distratification fans that's going to screw with the refrigeration guys the most? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Like I'm, I'm so tired of moving vents and everything else. And then usually the HVAC contractors wants to be no help because they're they're working off the print, which I get it. They're working off the print, and uh, you know then it just turns into this finger pointing contest. So that's why some stuff like that doesn't get fixed. I mean, some service guys don't understand. Like it may not be the startup guy's fault because um, they may not want to pay for it, and then they're going to pay for it double down the road. Change order. <laughs> yeah, change orders. You got anything to add to that, Brett? Yeah, sometimes uh, you'll also have the uh, condensation fans uh, that are you know strapped on the back of the cases that basically uh, move air from behind the case out from underneath and vice versa. Usually, these fans are blowing upwards, and so it's sucking air from the floor. You know, pushing the air up to you know get rid of a little bit of condensation that might be forming underneath the cases because. You have drains down there. You have, you know, uh, that basically are putting a little bit of humidity up there uh, that are underneath the case. So the idea is, you know, to get that kind of, you know, get that humidity out from underneath there. Uh, problem is, is sometimes they also are blowing in the opposite direction, especially if the fans are up against the wall. They don't want to dirty up the wall. I had an instance where they had 
this done and I had been working on a case for two days trying to figure out, yeah, my discharge was at 28 degrees, but the product was at 40 and it didn't make any sense to me. I'm, I'm switching around plenums. I'm switching around fans. I'm checking speed on fans. I'm double, triple checking superheat, making sure all the, the cases, you know, the case shelves are at the proper, you know, proper distance, uh, making sure they weren't out and, and protruding into the load limit line. I had accidentally dropped a piece of paper and watched the piece of paper flutter across the floor. And I was like, whoa, where's all that air coming from? And it was because the air was blowing so hard down out the front of the case. It was actually going in towards the front and causing that, that, that product temperature to, to be elevated because it was adding such a load into the case. Uh, you were also, you know, you were talking about some other cases where you have to watch with the, the load limit. You were talking about the... Uh, the angled, uh, the angled shelves, as well as the peg shelves, um, those also do add BTU load to the cases. Um, for every row of peg shelf or every angled shelf, a lot of times in the IOM manual, it'll actually tell you, you know, every four foot section it adds, you know, 92 BTUs, you know, per four foot, uh, four foot section. So be mindful if you have two cases that are running just fine and you have another case that's struggling and you find that there's it's lined up with a whole bunch of pegboard or it lines up a whole bunch of angled shelves and you find that it's running a higher superheat and there's no explanation why you might have to do a load calc on that case and figure out, you know, is the expansion valve size for all those angled shelves that they put in there or is it not? Some of the older, older cases in the dairy, uh, they're called rear load dairy. Usually there's a little alcove in the back about, I don't know, six or eight inches and with a door in the back and those, you know, those doors are meant so they can load the product from behind so they can put the newer product from uh, newer product behind and push, you know, basically push the uh, older product towards the front. Those, those alcoves that are usually, I don't know, three foot by, like I said, about six, in six inches deep, six, eight inches deep. If there is not a shelf, um, a shelf extender, in towards that back the fact that there's holes on either side of the walls of that of that little alcove as well towards the top if those shelf extenders are not in there what will end up happening is just like with the angled shelves the air will just flow directly down to the lowest part of the case and basically make the product on the lowest shelf super cold and then all the rest of the shelves you know you yeah you will have the proper discharge air coming out of your honeycombs but then you also might have a shelf temperature of 36, 40 degrees. And it's because that air isn't actually going across the product originally intended. So I don't know. Do they make, I mean, you do a lot of startups. Do they, they still do rear load dairy or not? So much? Yeah. I mean, it depends on the customer. Walmart still puts in a lot of rear load dairy cases. So, I mean, they're, they're still doing it, but it, it just depends on the customer. So I'm, I'm still seeing them. I mean, I see them less than I did before, but you still do see them. And one thing with those real low dairy cases, you need to make sure is, is a dairy cooler working properly? Because if a dairy cooler is not, you know, if it's running warm, 38, 39 degrees, I mean, that's going to add more load to the cases too. Because I mean, those doors are insulated, but they're not that good. Then not that great. So you want to make sure those coils are clear on the back of the dairy cooler because it, they cut a lot of cardboard up in those, in those walk-ins and, Dairy cooler coils always seem to get uh, get uh, cardboard dust all over the back of the coils, and you end up not making temperature because the whole back of your coil has no airflow. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out, like with uh, what you were talking about earlier, with uh, I forgot I forgot to talk about this. It, if you're if you're making discharge air temp and you're having product temp issues and you're checking airflows and your airflows are kind of crap. One thing you want to make sure is like, I always shine my light up there and check the honeycombs. I mean, there's times you look at cases and they haven't had the honeycombs cleaned in eight years. I mean, they will just be absolutely filthy. So, I mean, if I'm working on a case and especially if it's been a problem case, like I'm going to pull those honeycombs. It's easy work. I mean, it's fill in work just, just to make sure you get your hours if whatnot. I mean, if it's slow, but I mean, I'm looking for honeycombs to clean because they're usually dirty and making sure that there's no uh, brackets in the back. 
that uh, baffles in the back. Hill Phoenix is notorious for putting baffles in their cases. So in the back, airflow baffles in the back walls to make sure you make sure those are actually uh, um, clear and you know clean. I mean, you may have to pull them apart and clean them. Make sure the coils are clean. You know, if you're having airflow issues or product temp issues, make sure your coils are spotless clean. Hill Phoenix cases are notorious for it because their coil spacing is so tight. You know, make sure that everything's uh, properly on those, properly cleaned and uh, set up and fans are all going. So that way you actually have uh, good airflow. And then one other thing to check on the Husband cases with the individual coils, I see this a lot every once in a while you see it on Facebook, is the back walls tend to cave in a lot from people pushing too much product in there. And you will actually have food fall from the back wall onto the top of the coil and it'll restrict the airflow going through the, through the coil. I mean, I pulled one out one time and found a couple pieces of, you know, packs of bacon that were like six years old and it was absolutely disgusting. I mean, same thing with hot dogs, but I don't think those go bad. <laughs> So that, that, that's one thing to check. I mean, make sure you absolutely have airflow. I mean, somebody could have fixed the back wall and just not removed the product out. Once you're, uh, once you're uh, figured that you got everything uh, cleared out of the coil, just make sure that that coil, as far as the product, make sure those coils are completely clear of any ice or frost. Too many times, you know, guys, uh, you know, technicians, they, they're, spraying the coils and, you know, not actually taking the back walls apart, not taking the actual plenum out. You have to make sure the, the cases are fully clear of any ice or you're going to be back there. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be in two days, but you'll be back there. I promise you. Yeah, that's one thing. And I mean, it just burned me the other day. Um, I, you know, had somebody walk in there and every- we, they checked the coils and they looked at the back of the coils and they had a little bit of ice and it was just a little bit of ice and uh, okay yeah we're fine with a little bit of ice we could deal with that and then come to find out the entire front of the coils were solid blocks of ice so it's one thing to be mindful of you need to check both sides especially on walk-in freezer coils I've seen that they changed up a, way, a lot of the way that the coils are circuited here lately and the fronts of the coils seem to ice up more now so that's one thing you need to be mindful of is actually checking that. And then Hill Phoenix cases, frozen doors, I mean, are absolutely terrible to de-ice. Everybody knows that, especially the electric defrost ones. So one thing to be mindful of how I've, how I've show guys to do it. So I do it two ways. I either use Harbor Freight magnets, like really strong magnets to hold up the back walls. So you, what you do is you take the back wall, stick your screwdriver through it, pull the back wall of the case up you, and you can put the mag, the big, the, the hundred pound magnet on there, and it'll, like right on a shelf and it'll hold the, the back wall up or you shoot uh, self tappers in between the shelf rails and the back wall on each one. So that way it holds up the, uh, holds up the back wall. So you could actually pull the, the, pull the, the top coil cover off because if you don't pull that thing off, that coil is only exposed like five inches. It's back there another eight inches. And I've seen time and time again where guys de ice, you know, what they think they see. And then that coil is another five, six inches back there. And the whole back side of the coil still has a bunch of ice on it. You know, they de ice it and think everything's fine and they leave. And somebody's back there and like two, three weeks later after it loses airflow again. So do you want to talk about the um, medium temp uh, cases, how they're supposed to defrost? So medium temp cases should be off time defrost for the most part. I mean, certain customers use hot gas for all their medium temp cases. I mean, I don't think that's necessary, but that's just how that certain customer does it. But you will find meat cases with electric and hot gas. Most of the time for medium temp, we're going to be doing off cycle defrost. So that's either going to be shutting off the liquid flow. Not my preferred method of it. It takes way longer. I would like to use a suction stop if I'm, if I'm doing it. So meaning an EPR with a suction stop solenoid or an electronic EPR. So we're backing up all that liquid and 
liquid refrigerant and your back with all that suction vapor up in there. And it tends to help aid in defrost because now that liquid has mass to it and it's going to warm up and then help defrost the, you know, defrost the coil all the way through. It's going to warm up in the tubes and eventually it's going to aid with a little bit of defrost. So that, that is how we're doing off cycle defrost. One thing you got to watch out for is when you're doing termination with discharge air temp, especially on medium temp cases is what is, tends to happen is if you don't have enough defrost time and uh, depending on where the temp sensor is, the middle of the case tends to thaw out before the ends do. So if you see a case that is, you know, if your humidity is good in the store and you see a case where like the, the center of the coil is clear, but the left and right hand side has got more ice on it, more frost and ice on it. You may have to extend your minimum defrost time a little out a little bit or raise your term temp up a little bit or not terminate on case temperature at all if you're uh, not defrosting on the ends properly. So I, I don't know if you've seen much of that. Yeah, t- typically I like to see the case uh, termination on min. So basically it's going to take the lowest case temperature um, and defrost off of it. Because if you do average, you know, one might be... 60 degrees one might be at 30 well you know the average of that might be you know right at termination temperature so you have to preferably i like to always see it at, at min if you have uh, if you have a case set up where it's average for the case temperature and it's actually using the same same average to, uh, to terminate it sometimes what you can do is you could do a, another pr- uh, program the case for defrost termination sem- sensors and then basically just copy the copy the discharge air ones and use the you know tell the defrost termination sensors to actually be min usually if you have a conventional parallel rack where you have the liquid line solenoid and the you know electronic epr or mechanical epr back at the rack you want both those valves to shut off because you don't want to have intermittent liquid levels by throwing a whole bunch of liquid uh, in the in the lines, you know, you might stow 250 foot worth of pipe um, of refrigerant out into that case. And so, you know, like we said before, with, you know, opening up the EPR, the mechanical EPR, you know, when that case comes out of defrost, you're going to have potentially a large quantity of, of liquid coming back and, and flooding out your rack. Making, uh, yeah, if you do have your... Uh, if you do have a, a loop system where you actually have a suction stop and, you know, either a suction stop or an EPR and solenoid at the case, it's not as imperative to shut down the liquid line solenoid um, because basically the EPR is going to be right at the exit of the lineup. You might be all the way back at the rack, um, you know, storing, like I said, 250, 300 foot worth of uh, refrigerant out into the system. Go ahead, Kevin. Sorry. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's that's how you want to go through and do it. I wanted to go over one thing I uh, just remembered about that um, earlier we were talking about making sure if, like the power heads are right and you were going over the charges. I completely slipped this and I forgot I wanted to throw this in here. So uh, a couple things with that. So on Husband cases, on especially all their uh, frozen food doors now, they are coming out with C charges instead of Z charges on all their frozen food doors for like the last like two, three years, I think they've been doing it unless it's customer spec the other way, because they're actually getting better results out of using a C charge. And then what ends up happening is a lot of these doors are going to use for dual temp operation. So being used for medium temp also, so with them using a C charge, they're still able to hit the low super, you know, super heats required for low temp. And then they're also still able to hit the, uh, you know, keep, keep stable super heat for medium temp better. So if you see a C charge in a freezer, I mean, that's, it's still going to work. I mean, it's good down to minus 10, like Brett said, but I mean, it's not the ideal application, but it's not the reason your case is going to be running warm. So I don't know. Have you, have you seen those, Brett? No, actually, I haven't. <laughs> yeah, like the last we just we just did a bunch of glass door changeouts for the last two and a half months. I've been starting up a lot of glass door changeouts. 
I think out of uh, like 11 stores we did, every single Huntsman case came out with C charges. And then like the last couple startups or the last couple of years is they've all been C charges. Well, it could be too that, you know, stores are starting to try to raise the temperature of their ice cream. You know, years ago they used to do minus 12, you know, minus 15. Now they, now they keep raising it up. You know, some, some stores that we have only keep their ice cream at negative eight negative six so obviously you don't yeah i mean that's my set points if, if i'm commissioning a store like i'm i'm putting the ice cream at minus eight there's no reason to run it at minus 12 or minus 10 i mean that's just wasting energy the last thing i wanted to go over was actual like superheats so we'll make this real quick and then we'll start to wrap it up so the actual superheat so if i'm setting superheats on a case like for low temp i'm shooting for like three to five degrees and for medium temp, I'm shooting from like eight to five degrees. The lower you can get that superheat and keep it stable and just make sure that that low swing's not hitting, you know, zero or make sure that low swing's not hitting. I try to aim for my low swing. So if my valve's swinging low to like three degrees and up to like six or eight, I'm, I'm happy with that. Like, I'll, I'll take that. The lower you get that superheat, the more flooded out that coil is, the more efficient that coil is going to be. And the higher you could raise that suction saturation temp to get that case to run more efficient. So you want to get that, you know, you want to have those colder temps coming back to the rack. So you can maintain that 20, 20, the 30 to five degrees of superheat at those compressors, because that's going to make everything run more efficiently and everything's going to run a lot better. You're not going to break down oil, but my, my targets for superheats are unless the manufacturer says something different are, three to five for low temp and like six to eight for medium temp or like, I'm sorry, five to eight for medium temp, depending on what I'm working on. Yeah. The only exception to those rules are coffin cases, you know, whether it's in medium temp or low temp, you know, Hill Phoenix and Hussman like to maintain three to five on their bunker cases. Uh, the other exception to the rule are low profile uh, heat craft evaporators. Now, when I talk about the heat uh, low profile units, I'm talking about the evaporators that have two coils and the fans directly uh, in the middle, where they're basically the fans are pointing down. Uh, you try to set them for six to eight, you're going to end up starving out one side of that that evaporator coil. Yeah, you see that a lot. I mean, a lot. So I, another thing on those coils is you need to make sure the distributor's pointing down or else they won't feed properly either. I, I've seen on the last couple startups I've done, I've seen distributors coming out sideways and uh, we actually had to bend them down and use a street 90 to go into them to actually get them to point down because they, they seem to not feed properly unless the distributor's pointed down so we can feed, feed off the sides. Every single one I get of those, they're all pointing. They're all pointing side, sideways. That's why I think that's why uh, Heatcraft wants you to have the have the superheated three to five, because by flooding it flooding it that much, you know, you're uh, basically you know basically getting a full column of liquid at, to that distributor. Yeah, I mean it's probably doing the same thing. We, we were actually putting these together from the beginning, so I mean they didn't have valves mounted in them, so. We ended up just pointing them down. I, I think it works a little better. So, I mean, but I, obviously if you're not going to you pump the thing down, if you could just flood the coil out. So, well, I think that's uh, going to be a wrap on this one. I mean, I, I think we covered a lot. And this will probably end up being a two-part episode. We'll probably add on more to this as we go on with uh, maybe some more walk-in troubleshooting and, as we break down them, we're going to go farther into the rack troubleshooting. And then uh, I think next next couple episodes after this is going to be about uh, oil. It seems like most guys want to get into the oil systems. That sounds good to me. We'll get into, uh, get into doing the low temp. Uh, we didn't really, we touched on some low temp uh, case diagnostic, but uh, we'll, we'll cover that a lot more as far as how the operation is supposed to go sequence operation as far as defrost fan termination all that other stuff on the next one all right guys have, have a good night